Hare Krishna. So today we are discussing the appearance of Sukadev Goswami. This is <clears throat> chapter 19 of Srimad Bhagavatam, the very last chapter of the first canto. This chapter <laughs> describes how Prickett has uh, agreed to give up his kingdom and uh, he is uh, going to fast and uh, all the sages from various parts of the universe have come to attend to the uh, holy and very amazing event of uh, uh, Pariket leaving his body. So they're all uh, carefully getting ready to uh, uh, hear, and some of them are getting ready to speak. And as we're going to discover that uh, these various sages have somewhat of a disagreement among themselves on what is the uh, proper way to respond to Prickett's questions and his situation. And then, lo and behold, Sukadev Goswami enters the picture. And when he enters a picture, um, everyone defers to him. And he is given the uh, seat, the supreme seat of uh, the assembly. And then... Uh, it is Sukadev Goswami who will be responding to Parikit Maharaj's questions. And everybody agrees. You know, we're going to hear about how he, his body was perfectly formed. And the sages who understood uh, physiognomy, they could uh, recognize that uh, they should stand aside and let um, Sukadev Goswami speak. And that they do. He begins to answer the uh, questions of Prickett. And we hear that uh, Sukadev Goswami, when he arrives, he is uh, naked and uh, he is being followed by uh, some women and children who think of him as being someone who is uh, retarded or uh, not fully mentally present. And uh, then when they see the reaction of all these illustrious sages from all over the universe uh, and offering obeisances to uh, Sukadev Goswami, they immediately realize that uh, they were mistaken, that uh, Sukadev Goswami is a very, very illustrious person. And they desist in following him, and then he's given the seat of honor in the sages there, uh, clustered around where uh, Maharaj Prickett is getting ready to leave his body. As we discussed last week, uh, oftentimes this is described as being uh, on the Ganges, but uh, actually um, in one of the purports, we're hearing that Prabhupada's putting forward the idea that actually it was in the Jamuna. Uh, and of course, the Jamuna, I think, and the Ganges, they, uh, Jamuna is one of the tributaries or something like that. So in one sense, it could be both. Okay, so here is our verse for today. Uh, let me get set up here. Uh, Nava idam rajasi varya chitram. Nava idam rajasi varya chitram. Bhavatsu krishnam samanu vrateshu. Bhavatsu krishnam samanu vrateshu. Yedyasanam raja kirita jushtam. Ye dhyasanam raja kirita jushtam sadyo jahur bhagavat parshvakamaha sadyo jahur bhagavat parshvakamaha navar idam raja sivarya chitrang 
Pavatsu Krishnam Samanu Vrteshu Yejasanam Rajakirita Jushtang Sadyo Jahur Bhagavat Parshvakamaha Na, neither. Va, like this. Idam, this. Rajarshi, saintly king. Varya, the chief. Chitram, astonishing. Bhavatsu, unto all of you. Krishnam, Lord Krishna. Samanu, Vrteshu, unto those who are strictly in the line of. Yehu, Adyasanam, seated on the throne. Rajakirita, helmet of King, helmets of kings, Jushtam decorated, Sadyaha immediately, Jahu gave up, Bhagavat the personality of Godhead, Parshvakamaha desiring to achieve association. So the um, translation uh, reads as follows The sages said, O chief of all the saintly kings of the Pandu dynasty, who are strictly in the line of Lord Sri Krishna. It is not at all astonishing that you gave up your throne, which is decorated with the helmets of many kings, to achieve eternal association with the personality of Godhead. Uh, I'll read that again. The sages said, O chief of all the saintly kings of Pandu dynasty, who are strictly in the line of Lord Sri Krishna, it is not at all astonishing that you gave up your throne, which is decorated with the helmets of many kings, to achieve eternal association with the personality of Godhead. Purport Foolish politicians who hold political administrative posts think that the temporary posts they occupy are the highest material gain of life and therefore they stick to those posts even up to the last moment of life without knowing that achievement of liberation as one of the associates of the Lord in his eternal abode is the highest gain of life. The human life is meant for achieving this end. The Lord has assured us in Bhagavad Gita many times that going back to Godhead, his eternal abode, is the highest achievement. Maharaj Prahlad, while play, praying to Lord Nishingha, said, Oh my Lord, I am very much afraid of the materialistic way of life, and I am not the least afraid of your present ghastly, ferocious feature as Nishingha Day. This materialistic way of life is something like a grinding stone, and we are being crushed by it. We have fallen into this horrible whirlpool of the tossing waves of life. And thus, my Lord, I pray at your lotus feet to call me back to your eternal abode as one of your servitors. <clears throat> this is just the summit liberation of this material way of life. I have very bitter experience of the materialistic way of life. In whichever species of life I have taken birth, compelled by the force of my own activities, I have very painfully experienced two things, namely separation from my beloved and meeting with what is not wanted. And to counteract them, the remedies which I undertook were more dangerous than the disease itself. So I drift from one point to another, birth after birth. And I pray to you, therefore, to give me shelter at your lotus feet. The Pandava kings, who are more than many saints of the world, knew the bitter result of the materialistic way of life. They were never captivated by the glare of the imperial throne they occupied. And they sought always the opportunity of being called by the Lord to associate with him eternally. Maharaj Purkrit was the worthy grandson of Maharaj Yudhishthir. Maharaj Yudhishthir gave up the imperial throne to his grandson. And similarly, Maharaj Purkrit, the grandson of Maharaj Yudhishthir, gave up the imperial, son, the imperial throne to his son, Janamanjaya. That is the way 
of all the kings in the dynasty because they were all strictly in the line of Lord Krishna. Thus, the devotees of the Lord are never enchanted by the glare of materialistic life, and they live impartially, unattached to the objects of the false, illusory, materialistic way of life. Nava idam rajashi varya chitram bhavat sukrishnam samanu vrteshu ye jasanam rajakirita jushtang sadyo jahur bhagavat parshvakamaha. The sages said, O chief of all the saintly kings of the Pandu dynasty who are strictly in line of Lord Sri Krishna. It is not at all astonishing that you give up your throne, which was decorated with the helmets of many kings, to achieve eternal association with the personality of Godhead. Parikit could understand that his time of life was coming to an end, and instead of being confused or perplexed <coughs> or fearful, Maharaj Parikit knew exactly what to do to prepare himself for uh, leaving his body by taking shelter of the sages. So he went to the Jamuna, and there he encountered various sages and he asked them two questions. What should one do uh, in life? And finally, what is the duty of one about to die? So these are the two questions that he asked them. We see in a similar way, if we go all the way back to chapter one of Srimad Bhagavatam, we have the sages at Naimisharanya, and they're asking questions in the very uh, first chapter of this canto. But here we have a different setting. Here it is Sukadev Goswami replying to Parikit, and he's asking two basic questions. What is the duty of people in general? And specifically, what is the duty of a person who is about to die? Well, this is the important, most, most important question. And in general, what we see here is that um, we should not hang on, as Prabhupada used to say, till the fag end of life. We should uh, attempt to get ourselves free. So this is my main theme for uh, today's discussion is that you have to give up your occupation before you give up your life. You cannot simply um, go uh, on and on until actually, finally, we're bedridden, finally, we can hardly move, finally, we can hardly do anything, and then give up our body. Rather, life should be arranged in such a way that as we get uh, older, usually in Vedic terms is meant around 50, 50 years of age. Uh, at that point, one should break off from whatever occupation one is engaged in. One should phase out of it. And uh, by phasing out of it, one becomes more focused then on the fact that soon it'll be time to give up this body. And when it's time to give up this body, then no one can say, wait, 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 I need to finish something up. Prabhupada uh, tells a story about one dying Indian man who begged his doctor to give him one or two more years, as if the doctor had that within his power, you know. When the um, uh, death personified comes to claim our body, then we cannot decide that uh, we need a little bit more time to finish up loose ends. There's no such uh, uh, arrangement in the material world. No, we have to go right then and right now. And we cannot uh, decide that we want to wait uh, any longer. In this uh, particular verse, 
we see that uh, uh, Pricket is being glorified, that uh, he did not hesitate to give up the situation that he was in, and he was in a very desirable situation. Who doesn't want to be king? Uh, everybody wants to rule the world, as the song, the modern song goes. Uh, we want to um, be the people who are in control. And uh, those who are in control, they enjoy all sorts of resources that others don't have. And this is why people want to be in control. But it's not up to us. Um, when uh, the time to die comes, then we cannot uh, delay. We have to immediately go. And uh, this is something that we have no control over. So, therefore, um, we cannot delay even a moment uh, further. We have to leave. Even if we have millions of dollars, even if we have uh, a great kingdom, so, um, I don't know, maybe you all have, uh, you know, uh, had dreams of finding a lot of money or uh, of suddenly being very important or something like that. Uh, uh, and if you have a dream where you uh, find a lot of money, then uh, when you wake up, you are immediately uh, depressed. Because you realize that uh, it was only a dream, that you really don't have a lot of money, that uh, your imagination that you are uh, now uh, very, uh, you'll have all kinds of sense gratification is gone. But actually, that's what our whole life is, that uh, we dream that we have this or that or the other. We know that usually, according to karma, most people never never get very far along on the scale of either being important or having uh, control or being wealthy. You know, these are, you know, fame, uh, wealth, and uh, power are things that mostly escape most of our grasp. Only a very rare few, they get these things. So you can imagine how when you do get these things, how attached you must be to these uh, things. This is why actually not being wealthy, not being famous, not being powerful, in one sense are a very uh, good benediction because the tendency to be attracted or attached to these things uh, in an inordinate degree is much, much reduced. When you don't have anything, when you aren't any big person in society, it's much easier to just think, okay, now's my time to go. You know, you have less to be attached to. But imagine for someone who is very famous. Imagine for someone who is very wealthy. Imagine for someone who is very powerful, like a king. It must be very, very difficult. Yet, Pericket was able to just leave aside everything. And he did it almost on a moment's notice. We hear in the um, verses that um, he felt that he was attached to his uh, uh, family and his kingdom. So Krishna took it away. Um, at least that's his own estimation of what was going on. So... Um, Obviously, he wasn't that attached or he wouldn't have been able to do it. Uh, and he did it quite easily. So uh, that shows that Krishna gave him special mercy and he was a very exalted soul. Uh, without being an exalted soul, one cannot easily give up the material world. So um, this is the prayer of Prahlad Maharaj. This is actually from the ninth chapter of Seventh Canto where Prahlad Maharaj has just witnessed his own father being killed by Nishringadev. So Nishringadev was, um, you know, uh, 
uh, appeared because Hiranyakashipu, Prahlad's father, had demanded, where is your God? And Prahlad uh, replied that he's everywhere. And uh, to prove him wrong, Hiranyakashipu said, is he in this pillar? And Prahlad simply replied, yes, he's everywhere. And uh, when Hiranyakashipu struck the pillar, Nishringadev appeared from the pillar. And uh, after a short battle with Hiranyakashipu, of course, uh, Nishingadev was victorious and killed Hiranyakashipu. Immediately following were Hiranyakashipu's soldiers and guards, and they all were also killed by Nishingadev. And the demigods were all there, and they were so happy that this great demon, Hiranyakashipu, was now gone. However, Nishingadev did not give up his uh, intense and angry mood. He was so intense and so angry that all the demigods were afraid. Even Lakshmi Devi could not look at her husband in this form as Ugra Nishinga, as very angry Nishinga. So Lord Brahma, he asked Prahlad, uh, this form of Sri uh, Krishna in the form of Nishingadev has come for you. So you please go and pacify him. Otherwise, we are too afraid. <laughs> and so you can imagine all these great demigods with all their powers and all these uh, very powerful uh, people, and they decide that the right person to approach this uh, immensely ferocious form of the Lord is this five-year-old boy. You know, uh, they're all uh, terrified, but they put forward Prahlad, and Prahlad's not at all um, inhibited. He's not at all uh, taken aback at having to approach Nishringadev. So this um, excerpt here that Prabhupada, uh, you know, puts together is from various um, verses in the uh, seventh canto, ninth chapter, from about 22 to 42. Oh, my Lord, I'm very much afraid of this materialistic way of life. I'm not in the least afraid of your present ghastly, ferocious feature as Nishringadev. This materialistic way of life is something like a grinding stone, and we are being crushed by it. We have fallen into this horrible whirlpool of the tossing waves of life, and thus, my Lord, I pray at your lotus feet to call me back to your eternal abode as one of your servitors. This is the summit liberation of this materialistic way of life. I have... Um, very bitter experience of the materialistic way of life in whichever species of life I have taken birth. Compelled by the force of my own activities, I have very painfully experienced two things, namely separation from my beloved and meeting with that which is not wanted. And to counteract them, the remedies which I undertook were even more dangerous than the disease itself. So I drift from one point to another, birth after birth, and I pray to you, therefore, to give me shelter of your lotus feet. Oh, this is uh, uh, what Prahlad is saying to Nishringadev. And uh, this shows that Prahlad is not intimidated by Nishringadev, but it focuses on what the real purpose of life is. This is our real purpose of life that we have to prepare ourselves for de death. Ante Narayana Smriti, you know, at the end, one has to focus on the Supreme Lord. That is the purpose of life. If at the end of life we remember Krishna, our life is perfect. If at the end of life we don't remember Krishna, we have blown it. We have uh, not perfected our lives. And uh, this is the main uh topic that we are uh, looking at here. It's very easy to just go day after day 
managing the various necessities that life always places before us one day after another. Each day, there's always some hurdle, like uh, those long-distance runners that have to jump various uh, hurdles, you know. Uh, and as they run, they can't just run, they have to jump over a hurdle as well, and then the next hurdle, and then the next hurdle. And this is the way life is, that we have to keep running and we're jumping over these hurdles. But we should gradually uh, convince ourselves. And uh, this is something every person should think very carefully about. That as I get older, you know, as I approach, you know, my 40s and 50s, I should figure out how I am going to detach myself from the occupation that I have uh, adopted. Everyone has to have an occupation in the material world. There's no possibility of uh, escaping without some sort of occupation. However, we should at the same time think about it and formulate some kind of transitional system. Whatever we think is the best way to do it, we should uh, formulate some system to gradually delete the material uh, necessities. Uh, we should maybe put away some money or whatever it is, uh, and we should think, you know, okay, I'm not going to try to hang on to the top position till I die because at that point I will have wasted my life. Uh, you cannot take it with you as they say. So renunciation means that we have to be like Pericket, that uh, we have to be ready to put aside everything at some point. And uh, rather than force material nature to point the gun at our head, we should understand it's coming and make some gradual system that more and more puts us in a setting where now we can, uh, you know, have enough money to live. And if we don't, we are uh, convinced that we will get by on whatever we have. Uh, and uh, in this way, we are not going to continue into our 60s and our 70s and our 80s simply working away, simply struggling at some business, simply struggling uh, with some occupational um, engagement, simply uh, working and meeting the day-to-day -day necessities of uh, uh, the various struggles and uh, challenges that are brought by material nature. So renunciation at the end of life is the real message of um, spiritual awareness that anyone who is actually spiritually aware can understand that this is what we really should be doing. So um, at the very end here, you know, uh, Prickett, is aware that he is uh, soon to leave his body. He's aware that uh, uh, there's nothing that can stop it, and he doesn't want to stop it. And now he is also ready to give up this body of uh, his. And uh, he is using his last seven days as an opportunity to hear Srimad Bhagavatam, as it was spoken by Sukadev Goswami for the first time. So it was uh, written by Vyasadev, and uh, Vyasadev taught it to his son in the womb. Sukadev Goswami heard Srimad Bhagavatam in the womb, and then when he came out, he immediately left, and uh, he shows up at this uh, opportune moment where we have um, Pricket getting ready to fast until death. At this moment now, um, 
we are going to hear Bhagavatam for the first time. And in this group of sages is uh, Sutta Goswami, who will later describe the very same thing. And he will describe it in the uh, convocation of sages meeting at Naimi Sharanya, which will be somewhat later. <coughs> The uh, thousand-year sacrifice at Naimisharanya has already begun, but Sutta Goswami exited that uh, group of sages and came to hear Pariket being uh, uh, given this knowledge by Sutkadev Goswami, and then Sutta Goswami will later go back to the sages at Naimisharanya and repeat the same thing. Um, so, uh, I'm going to pause at this point and see if we have any questions or any um, uh, realizations or anything from any of our uh, devotees that are attending this uh, Zoom conference. Uh, so over to you, 10-4. See, <laughs> see what uh, uh, we have here from our, our audience. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, with the de current demands of modern society or the society that we live in now, um, is it possible to commingle, our, or if you are like a grahasta, can you commingle a working lifestyle along with a devotional lifestyle? Yeah, you have to to some extent. Um, when you are um, involved in household life, you have so many responsibilities. So you have to provide for uh, the sustenance of the family. But um, at the same time, you should have one eye on the door that uh, you will have to think about, how will I gradually work out of this? Because at some point, the kids are going to be gone. And at some point, you're going to start uh, get it, getting older. And at that point, you'll have health issues and things like that, which is what uh, always happens as people get older. And before uh, you get much older than 50 or 60 years old, at that point, there should be a transitional phase where you figure out, how will I live without having to daily go to a job or daily go to a factory or daily go to the uh, business and, um, you know, figure out how I'm going to get my customers and uh, what I will uh, offer them in, in return for their money, you know. Th this is how we have to think. So, um, older uh, as we get older, nature has actually kind of helped us because in all societies, it's generally thought that as people age, that they will start to get closer to retirement. In our, you know, our modern world, especially nowadays, uh, we see that people don't retire. Uh, they keep on working. Uh, even you know, not what to speak of as Prabhupada was putting forth here in this purport. Prabhupada was describing that these uh, politicians, they feel like they're on top of the world. They're certainly not going to give up their... Uh, uh, Amber alert for a child being lost. <laughs> Why they have to do it at... Uh, Eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning. Who can who can understand? But at any rate, um, why uh, the, uh, the 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 society that we have tries to convince us that there is no possibility of at any point uh, stopping work. We must be attentive, but we should understand that this is a fraud. That uh, we must find some way to figure out some type of uh, transitional system where, you know, uh, we will be great, gradually more and more reducing our uh, commitment to our occupation. And this will give time uh, either to leave 
the husband and wife leave and they travel to holy places. That's one option. And the other option is to engage in uh, spiritual uh, uh, preaching activities, if we can uh, engage in preaching activities. And this can, of course, happen gradually. You know, you can, it uh, doesn't have to be one day, okay, that's it, now I'm gone. But uh, gradually we can move from uh, a situation where, you know, we are um, still mingling our uh, material affairs and at the same time trying to do some preaching to the point where we're gradually phasing it out. Other questions or uh, comments? This is our theme then for today, that we are trying to uh, mm, take a hint from uh, Prickett Maharaj. Uh, You can imagine how difficult it must have been for him. He was not really that advanced in years as far as I understand it, Uh, but uh, he could understand that uh, because of this curse that had been pronounced upon him, that soon he would have to give up everything. So there was no chance of um, continuing on. And uh, he, as we read a few verses ago last week, um, actually prayed that uh, this uh, reaction for him acting uncivilized, as he termed it, by draping the dead snake Um, on the shoulders of Shamak Rishi. He prayed that the reaction would come immediately and that it would not impact his family, but only him, and it would not impact his kingdom, but only him. And uh, in one sense, that's what happened. But of course, when uh, Pariket was immediately... uh, given seven days to live, which is how uh, it turned out, he could understand that his kingdom would be impacted because uh, his kingdom needed him. But still, he didn't waver. And as Prabhupada explains in the purport here, he turned over his kingdom to his son, Maharaj Janmajaya. So Janmajaya becomes the next ruler in line and he takes over for his father, Prickett. And later on, Janmajaya will come to know how his father died, that this Takshaka, this snake bird, was the uh, culprit that uh, bit his father. And uh, Janmajaya decides then to take revenge on all the serpents of the universe. And he has the uh, <coughs> um, all the uh, brahmanas create a fire sacrifice, but it's a very unusual fire sacrifice. They create a fire sacrifice that is hopelessly and intensely attractive to all snakes. And once they go into the fire sacrifice, they are burned up. So thousands and thousands of serpents are being destroyed by Janmajaya's snake sacrifice. And um, as this is happening, um, the snakes and uh, their mother, Kadru, they approach the demigods to do something about it. And... uh, the demigods then approach Janmajaya and ask him to desist. And uh, after some time, Janmajaya agrees to uh, give up the snake sacrifice and to end it. And therefore, all the snakes of the world are saved. 
And, you know, of course, uh, we might think, you know, why didn't we just let John Magia go through with this and we wouldn't have to worry about snake. But um, that's not the way things work. Uh, the Supreme has a purpose and a place for everything in the universe. There was similarly another Rakshasa sacrifice. And there was similarly when Dhruva wanted to end all the yakshas because uh, one had killed his brother. So he was extinguishing all the yakshas. And again, the demigods came and asked Janmajaya to desist. I mean, not Janmajaya, but uh, Dhruva to desist from his uh, um, war of, um, you know, uh, getting rid of one ethnic group. So everything has its place. And uh, even scorpions, even snakes. And therefore, the Supreme Lord is um, looking after everything. And uh, the uh, karmic system is designed so that each place on the karmic wheel has something that it offers Otherwise, it wouldn't exist. A particular living being, a person, takes a particular body as a result of a particular karma. And therefore, we have all these 8,400,000 species of life. Each one is directly suited for a particular karma. So, depending on how the living entity abuses his human form of life is which non-human form of life that human being will be demoted to once he or she leaves the body. When we leave the body, we have to take some other form if we have not made use of the human body. Now, what does it mean to make use of the human body? It means that we have done something other than follow animal propensities. We know animals eat, sleep, mate, and defend. And if we look at our society, we see that most humans, if you take an inventory of what they did their whole life and you remove uh, what time that they ate, you remove what time that they defended, you remove the time that they uh, either were directly involved in sex life or the products of sex life uh, providing for them, and you remove when they were defending their territory or establishing their dominance, you remove those things from their life, you see you have nothing left. You're left with zero. There was no time for self-realization. Uh, there was no time for religion because they were busy eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. And this is what animals do. And therefore, material nature says, all right, you are living the same way animals do. Then now take an animal body. And the uh, person who failed to use their human form of life now is given simply an animal body. And uh, as an uh, animal now, they have to burn off the karma that they accumulated as a human being. And eventually, uh, after many, many lifetimes, the animal will again be promoted uh, step by step, lifetime after lifetime, to a higher animal until that animal comes back to a human form. And as we know, uh, the way that Kali Yuga is, things are so dark and so uh, ignorant that most people are totally unaware of the great opportunity that they have as a result of being a human. They imagine that that's all they could be. They imagine it was their first time. They're not aware that being a human is a special thing and that you could have been an animal, you could have been a plant, you could have been even a microbe. But you're a human. And as a human, you have a possibility that 
all the other forms of life do not possess. And if you waste it, you will again be retrograded into an animal form once more. So uh, the human form of life is uh, something that is very important, very rare. And in our modern world, no one knows this and no one knows what the purpose of human life is. Uh, unlike Maharaj Prickett, who was well aware of the purpose of human life. So we've got uh, six minutes left. Any other uh, questions or realizations about um, the topics of this particular uh, verse in Srimad Bhagavatam? Maharaj, our mm -hmm. thoughts at the time of leaving this body, are our thoughts determined by our karma or the way we live our life? Our thoughts? Is that what like you're our asking? Final, our final thoughts at when we are leaving this body, like oh, if I you see. think of Krishna or you think of you know, the spiritual world or something of that nature. Yeah. Um, that's why uh, that verse is there, Ante Narayana Smriti, that uh, we should train our thinking so we're always thinking of Krishna. And then naturally, when uh, we are in a situation where we're about to leave the body, we will naturally think of Krishna. Sometimes people have the uh, a false uh, attitude, uh, the faulty attitude that um, I will live how I want, and then when I get ready to die at that point, I will beg Krishna to save me. Uh, but that generally won't happen because the nature of the mind is that it is conditioned. We talk about the conditional mind. So the mind has a conditioning. And uh, if that conditioning is materialistic all through life, then at the time of death, it will follow that same pattern. We will not be able to think of Krishna. We will only think about what we've been training our mind to think of all, all our lives. Now, if we're devotees and we have made an effort to try to focus our minds on Krishna, and maybe at the time of death we are disturbed by some uh, you know, calamity, some uh, accident or some uh, catastrophe, then Krishna will help us uh, at that point because we've actually made an effort to try to think of Krishna. But uh, uh, whatever we think about, uh, as we say, there's that verse in Bhagavad Gita, yam yam vapi smaran bhavam tyajante ante kalevaram, that whatever a person thinks about at the time of leaving the body, that state they'll attain. So that's another reason why we make an effort to train the mind to think about Krishna. And if we're chanting, if we're engaged in devotional service, it's natural to think about the things that we've been in general thinking about. So if we've been thinking about Krishna uh, at least uh, substantially during our lives, then at the time of death, we will naturally also think about Krishna. If, however, we've been thinking about material things, then at the time of death, not very likely that we'll think about Krishna. We'll likely think about something else because we will be drawn to it. We will rather think about, oh, what will my family do? Uh, oh, I'm losing now my uh, body. I will not be able to uh, have this money that I uh, worked so hard to possess. Just think what kind of a... Um, uh, uh, what's the right word? What kind of a um, letdown it is to work hard so much in your life and then as you're dying you realize that all of it is going to somebody else. You will never be able to use the rest of that money. You will never see it again. You are going you who knows where but uh, your money is not going with you. So uh, this is, uh, you know, the right way to actually uh, meditate. And 
we try to meditate on Krishna, then Krishna will help us, even if uh, the situation is very difficult. And, you know, Prahlad says that, and, uh, you know, other great personalities in the Srimad Bhagavatam also give us that same advice, that at the time of death, w- the mind may be very disturbed. In fact, Kula Shekara, King Kula Shekara prayed, that let my, uh, my uh, life end now while I'm young and while I'm uh, actually fit rather than let it end when I'm very uh, materially uh, exhausted and my um, senses are disturbed so much by disease and by other things. That way I'll easily enter into the lotus flower of thinking about the Supreme Lord rather than do it at a time when uh, instead my um, body is racked with pain and I'm in uh, a difficult situation. So it's a great um, benediction to die at a time when you know that you're dying. It's a great benediction to die uh, in association of devotees. It's a great benediction to die and uh, feel peaceful about it. And these things can happen if you get Krishna's mercy. And this is why, uh, you know, we make an effort to practice. If we don't practice, then uh, who knows? Anything could happen. Any other final thoughts? We're up at uh, nine right now. Yeah, thank you, Anil. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how about individuals who live on, you know, paycheck to paycheck and pay rent, or they might, they don't have any children to take care of them, or they may be, they even may end up homeless. How can they prepare to leave jobs so that they can fully perform service? Mm-hmm. There's... There's always some way that Krishna arranges things if you uh, make an effort. Uh, you, oftentimes, um, uh, the uh, there requires us. It, uh, I, I guess the right way to describe it is it requires us to adjust our mentality. That either now we have to uh, become even more. Uh, frugal so we can put something away or else in the future we have to think that at that point we have to be willing to do with much less than we're doing with now you know in some cases it probably requires a little of both Uh, but at any rate we'll discover that um, as uh, time moves forward that uh, there are ways that Krishna does arrange for things, you know. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully, as our movement goes forward, there will also be uh, some help from the movement itself. Right now, that's not really set up very much. We're discussing this right now in our sub conference, you know, devotee care. And um, we just heard a presentation from Garanga in... Um, uh, the Chopati temple there, they have a, uh, a thing called uh, devotee care, which they are chalking out various guidelines for how various uh, temples can provide in the future for devotees, especially those who have served in the temple, uh, how they can provide mostly medical uh, assistance, uh, but I think it also goes a little bit more than that. So uh, it's in place to some extent in India, but in the rest of the world, not so much. So they're chalking out various kinds of guidelines. Still, we we shouldn't count on that until uh, it actually manifests. But uh, there's some idea like that. The um, uh, various. Uh, necessities of the Society of Devotees uh, will take some time to fully manifest and flesh out. You know, there's many things as a movement that we should have, but we don't have yet because uh, 
the, the channels, the uh, cooperation, the commitment of various uh, devotees has not yet come together to make it possible to uh, make certain things uh, available. So, uh, uh, in India, of course, a lot of these things uh, have been traditionally handled in one way or another. Maybe not gorgeously, you know, in India generally, if you are, um, you know, uh, have uh, nothing as a subsistence, you can go to a temple and at least eat there, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, in some places like India where the climate isn't so bad you can you won't don't have to have an elaborate place to stay but uh, that means that we have to downsize our ability or our thinking so that we could uh, cope with that and uh, so again usually it's probably a little bit of both we have to um, you know uh, downsize what we expect you know, uh, and as you get older, it becomes a little easier to do that. And at the same time, we have to, at, at the present moment, uh, try to figure out what it would take to um, put something aside. Uh, and, you know, Krishna can reveal. And uh, I think these kind of things will be talked about in the circle of devotees as uh, uh, the movement matures and uh, some practical guidelines will be more and more uh, available to devotees who are groping with uh, how to deal with this issue appropriately. Thank you, Maharaj. That also goes to the point that you're saying um, we have to start detaching the things that we thought were important don't become so important anymore. Yeah, yeah. We have to gradually practice detachment um, you know, you have to fake it, and then eventually you actually come to the point where you do genuinely feel more and more detached from what's going on, and uh, you're able to uh, deal with uh, whatever comes your way much more easily. All right. So uh, I thank all of you for uh, joining us here uh, at uh, the Radha Govinda Wednesday morning Bhagavatam class on Zoom. And uh, so uh, I will be giving a class on Friday uh, in our Long Island, uh, you know, uh, group, you know, uh, Nityananda or Nirmal has arranged something and we're going to do a Zoom conference then. I've already sent out uh, the next week's various uh, uh, a, a schedule for what I'll, when I'll be speaking. I will also be speaking Sunday uh, at 4, our usual Russian class. And then at 6, I'll be giving the Sunday uh, program at Radha Govinda, so I'll do two uh, Zoom classes on Sunday, back to back, you know, right after the uh, uh, Sunday Srimad Bhagavatam, then I'm going to give the Zoom uh, Sunday program class at uh, 6 o'clock. And then on Monday, I will, uh, of course, do the Journey of Self Discovery. So um, thank you all very much, and, uh, you know, all glories to the Srimad Bhagavatam. All glories to the Vaishnav devotees of the Lord. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Krishna. All glories to you, Maharaj. Hari Hari Krishna. Remember Krishna today, and uh, you know, uh, uh, try to um, focus on the Supreme in some way or another by reading, service, by uh, uh, some other means, whatever you can use. <laughs> 